This is not me. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm not this guy either. And my wife kind of likes him, so that's not too bad. I'm probably him, but I don't think I'm this guy either. Um, a few hundred years ago, Michelangelo, Michelangelo got hungry. Um, he was too busy painting and sculpting to actually go to the shop himself, so he wrote a list. And to make sure he got what he wanted, he actually drew some pictures in there as well. And you think, how hard is it to get a banana? But if you can read the label there, it says curved yellow fruit. People don't always know what a banana actually is. The internet came along, and everything was just perfect. So um, I can probably end my talk here, I guess. Unfortunately, it's not the case. Um, let's jump into some code, because we're at JSConf. You guys like to code. Um, I'll do a quick revision of. Um, HTML5 forms. I know HTML5 has been around for a few years now, but not many people have really paid much attention to what's new and what's interesting. Um, if you want to play along at home, have a look on Wufu, because um, they have got a really awesome guide for HTML5 forms. First, some of the new input types. This one's email. Um, you can get custom keyboards for iOS and Android, which is really awesome. Um, Typing things into your phone is really hard at the best of times. You might have all sorts of fancy keyboards like swipe or whatever else like that, but it's still not as nice as actually having a full-fledged keyboard. So these are really handy. There is some basic validation that comes along with them as well. However, it's pretty flaky because um, most people, even the browser vendors, are not very good at doing validation. So we have email, tell, which is for telephone, URL, number, and then we were kind of hoping that there was going to be date time. If you've ever had to write a date picker before, um, I share your pain. It's not easy. Um, so the, it would be great if we could have native date pickers in the browsers. Opera was the first one to lead with the implementation of this, but it wasn't really that good a job, and most of the other browser vendors kind of had a half-hearted attempt but didn't really get anywhere. So from the HTML5 draft spec, they had all sorts of different ideas along date time. There was a weird one for week. How often do you actually have a week selector that you need a custom um, you know, input type for that? It was really weird. Uh, fortunately and unfortunately, um, it's gotten to the point now where the HTML5 spec is final, as you know. Um, so date and time are the only two to remain out of that, which is good. So hopefully at some point a browser vendor will support them properly. But it's been a bit here and there. It's a chicken and egg situation where you need the spec to be there and you need the browser support, but you know, which one's going to come first? Unfortunately, the chicken looks like this. Um, but despite ugly, ugly chickens, this, this is bizarre, this one. Um, date and time field to survive for the HTML5 or 5.1 draft spec. So there's hope alive. If the browser vendors actually want to do something about this, we might get there. Mozilla said they're probably not, um, but we'll see what happens. Until then, we have to keep writing our own. On to the attributes. Um, required is really awesome. This is HTML5 validation. So you can mark a field as required, and the browser will validate that for you. That's great. Placeholders are really cool because you can give a person an idea of what you'd like them to actually type in. Um, the problem with placeholders is quite often when you look at them, if you're not really paying attention, it kind of looks like the form field has been filled out already. So there's a bit of a UX situation here where you need to be careful about their use. It's in my example here, I've got my date time where I want DD, MM, YYYY. So it's not a bad idea of doing that, but you've got to be really sparing about how you use them because it can get pretty tricky fast. The one thing you should never, ever, ever do, otherwise I will find you and track you down, um, is you do not put floated, don't use placeholders as labels and you do not float labels in front of the, uh, the fields because 
Can anyone tell me what the focused field is? What am I meant to type into here? I've got absolutely no idea. Um, it's just really, really bad UX. It's gotten popular over the last few years, and I've got no idea why. Maybe people hate other people or something. Um, but yeah, avoid this. So note this down, just to wipe it from your memory from here. So if someone talks about this from here on, you'll say, what? I didn't even know you could do that, and I won't. Patterns. Patterns are really interesting. Um, they let you write regular expressions. Uh, statistically, I'm the one guy in the room that knows how regular expressions work. Um, this pattern here is really handy. In iOS, if you do slash d star, you can actually get a numeric keypad, which is great. So if you've got a field that requires numbers, most of your validation is taken care of already. You'll often see this pattern as uh, square bracket 0 dash 9, square bracket or close bracket star because most people don't know how to write regular expressions. This saves a couple of characters. Autocomplete, or this is autocorrect, um, usually want this to be off. This is uh, basically the, the browser coming in there and fixing something out. So if you're typing in a username, when you start typing a username, then the browser will start trying to fix it and says, uh, you know, so your name's Chris, do you mean some other word that's not your name, but I'm pretty sure I want my name in here. So when you've got fields that, like name fields, username, those kinds of things, adding this attribute on there and basically turning the feature off uh, makes it much nicer for your users uh, to use your forms. Auto capitalize is very similar, especially with the username. You don't want the first character that the person sees to be a capital. The first thing that usually happens is you're on your phone, up comes the you know, first character is capitalised, so you have to turn that off and then start typing. That's if you notice that. If you don't, then you start typing and it's like, oh, blast, the first thing is a capital. have to go back, change it again. Really annoying. Autofocus is pretty straightforward. The first thing on the form, if the form is the main part of the page, should have focus. So having autofocus means that when the browser renders the page, that first field is focused. That's great. The key thing to remember with autofocus is you do not ever polyfill autofocus. Because what happens is something like this. Um, here's my bank. I start typing in my ID. I'm not very good at typing, so I'm looking at the keyboard while I'm doing this. I tab across to the next field and start typing my password. At this point, the JavaScript kicks in, and the poly field gives me focus back to my ID field where I'm still typing my password, and then I look up and I'm like, oh, great, thank you very much. Um, as much as I've named and shamed these guys, they've actually fixed it up, which was awesome. I'm a customer, so every single time I'm using my online banking, I can just sit there and say, thank you for fixing that. One last thing on... Um, form elements. The select has been around essentially forever, but there's a lot of push against it at the moment not to use selects unless you really, really have to. They're pretty much the last resort. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that. This is a country selector. If you live in Zimbabwe or Zambia, like, your battery is going to run out before you actually get there. <laughs> We've got other problems here as well. I mean, the less obvious one is, especially when you've got longer, like, wider um, options in the select, they get truncated on mobile. And it's not uncommon to see, especially with that most hated thing of all, um, security questions. When you're filling out a security question, so what was your favorite, and you don't even see what it was. So not that it really means anything anyway, because you, you're feeling angry at the person who's written the form. Um, but you know, what was your favorite cat's name, or something like that, and you've got no idea. So be really, really careful with selects, especially when they're populated from databases. As you can see, this all that's thrown in there. Um, like, you know, let's make it wide enough so it looks great on my desktop browser, because no one uses mobiles, do they? So how do we actually build a form? Start with a form element. You write a field set. A field set is a logical group of form fields. 
A lot of people don't really use them. They can, they can use a div or something like that, but a field set's really useful. So this should be your first port of call after your form, even if you've only got one. It's really good uh, semantics to have in place there. There's the legend element, which is meant to be you know, the, the title of that field set. The legend element looks like a legend element no matter what you do in the CSS because it's one of those 90s era things. Um, for some reason, it's really hard to override. I don't use one. I usually use uh, like H3, H4, or actual uh, header elements to um, denote headers. That way you can have a bit of a hierarchy in there as well, especially when you've got nested field sets. It's really useful. Next, you can use a block element. This isn't strictly required. It's really useful for uh, JavaScript, or JSConf, if it writes JavaScript. Sooner or later, when you need a parent element to your, um, your field, something like a paragraph, list item, table header, table definition, anything along those lines, it's great. Next, you need a label. The label really has to have an ID set, otherwise it's basically an empty element. And that's the for, label for whatever the ID of that uh, form is. That means that when you tap or click on the, um, on the label, it gives you focus to the form element. This is really, really critical when you're doing something like a checkbox or a radio, because they're really hard to hit, especially, it's bad enough on a mouse if you're using your finger to tap on something. You've got no chance, all the worse if you haven't actually remembered that people use mobiles and you're trying to do a desktop sized site on your mobile and you're tapping on this tiny, tiny little thing, you're never going to get there. Um, but making the labels um, tappable, all you need to do is do this, the browser does it for you, nothing else is required. And then of course the field itself. So our code looks something along the lines of that. Awesome. Into design patterns. First thing you need to pay attention to is since, even if we're not necessarily thinking mobile, I mean, I work in a, a big company, um, trying to drag them into um, you know, the last decade is really hard and telling them that yes, people actually use mobiles. Uh, vertical label field pattern like this basically means that regardless of whether you're on desktop or mobile, you've got a really clear idea of what you're actually trying to achieve. Um, it doesn't really make much difference in terms of UX for completion rates and things like that as to where you put the label in relation to the field. But this pattern for me is basically my default unless there's a good reason to shift it otherwise. I mean, you could um, shift them around if you want to use um, like media queries so when the screen gets wide, you might put them somewhere else. There's a downside obviously with this is your height increases. Um, but I'm lazy, so I usually leave them like this. It's, pretty easy to see what's going on, so it's not too hard. Um, when you don't, you end up with something like this. This is um, when I was booking uh, lunch with my wife. And if anyone can tell me what any of those form fields are, then you know, good luck to you. So my main variation to that theme is the horizontal um, search pattern, which basically looks something along the lines of this. This is usually something I'd limit to an admin form. So obviously this is not going to work on a mobile or a small screen. So when you've got a controlled environment, so you know people are using big screens, especially with a search, you want it to be small and up the top so you can just get to the search results because that's what it's all about. If you're sitting there trying to work out what you're doing, it's, it's not great. This kind of thing is something I'd envisage as used by very frequent users and a handful of those that's, um, as well. This is the next step, the clear path to completion. This is probably the most critical thing to think about when you're designing a form. How do I get to the end? Because, show of hands, who loves filling out forms? Exactly. You would just want it to be over with as soon as possible. It doesn't matter if it's a short one or a long one or whatever else, you just want it to be done. So by making, making it clear how to get to that end, uh, it's a real help to actually getting people to fill the form out in the first place. It's one of the things when you're talking about forms is you're talking about completion rates because most people give up. So you have to basically be nice enough to let the person to get through to the end and don't put anything in the way to stop them. So on this one, uh, I've got my vertical labels and fields. So there's a nice, clear 
for us left to right users. If you're written, writing in Arabic, you'd flip that around to the right hand side. Uh, it's very easy to skim down and see what's going on. And the proceed button is really clear down the bottom. So right away I can tell what I'm in for before I've even started doing anything. There's been some really great work from uh, the gov.uk team. Um, this one is, I think, for, oh, it's registered to vote, if I can actually read it. Um, you can see they've got massive um, highlights around the, the form elements, so you can see what's got focus. The uh, radio or the checkboxes in this instance, it's pretty clear to see which one I've checked. It's not just relying on the simple UI. The CSS for this is really straightforward as well. Um, but these guys are doing really great work in, in making sure that you can see what's going on. Marking optional fields uh, was probably the most controversial UX change I've ever brought in because our standard way of doing things is put a little asterisk in there to show that it's required or something along those lines. That's just a bit of a form of habit that we've had over the years. The means of, or the reason we've done so as much as anything is that's what you do on a paper form. You have to kind of tell the person what's going on. If you're filling out a paper form and you get something wrong, you're not going to find out for a week or something until someone actually looks at it and then they send it back to you and then you have to start again. It's not great. Whereas on the web, we've got a more immediate feedback mechanism. Once you start marking optionals instead of marking required, you're shifting the balance between robot and human. Um, it becomes a more natural conversation rather than demanding things. So the normal way of doing things, like here, this would be a details form. So I'd need, I'd have to have your email address because I'm not going to get very far without that. But if you phone someone up and you're doing exactly the same form, when you phone them and say, hey, how are you going? Um, could I just have your email address? You must tell me your email address. That's what the asterisk is basically doing. You're hammering it into the user that they have to do it. It's just not how we communicate. So by marking the optionals, then it becomes a much more natural flow. Um, it's very really important to note that if a field is optional, then you probably shouldn't be including it on the form in the first place. But I know I work for a massive insurance company. Sometimes I just want to ask things because I just want to ask things. So you know, we use an optional or something along those lines. So at this point, we've got a form. Everything is cool. That's great. Unfortunately, no matter how well we've designed our form, our markup is perfect, everything's good. People get things wrong. The good thing is validation exists. So how do we validate? You've got to let people make mistakes. Um, you basically need to give them a chance. Give them the benefit of the doubt that they're going to have a, have a go at actually filling the, the field out correctly. So Apple very kindly provided an example of how not to do this. Uh, this is an email address that I was trying to type in. As soon as you start typing, the validation kicks in. It's impossible not to get an error message on this form, uh, unless you copy and paste, I guess. Now, we're all very technical users. When you're getting into very low-tech users, showing an error message is basically like a death, uh, death to completion rates because you know, they don't, they're kind of scared of what they're looking at in the first place, and then you're showing an error message at them and something's wrong, it's like, oh, man, I've broken it again. They're probably just going to give up and you know, call for someone else's help or not buy your product. Um, so you have to give them the chance to get it right. This is a similar example. Um, I was trying to buy a book from Book Depository. I couldn't remember what my password was. I just tabbed to retype password. I put focus on it because I was on my phone. And it's telling me that the passwords don't match. So technically they do because I've not put anything in yet. But the validation is just so aggressive that it's kicked in before it's actually given a chance. From a technical point of view, when you're writing a script, you need to basically go on blur. If you're doing anything prior to on blur, then you're not really being very nice about it. All these ones that we're seeing here, this is key press basically. If you're validating on key press, then um, please don't. And this is good old Sidney J. Harris. The real danger is not that computers will begin to think like men, men will begin to think like computers. Um, and this is that you need to be human. 
it's, that's the one thing that you remember from today is be nice, be human. Because your interface is not um, someone walking into a shop and there's a shop assistant to help them or probably look at their phone and not actually help you at all. Uh, but let's pretend the shop assistant is nice and they'll actually help you out. You don't get that on a computer. You might get a little chat thing that turns up in the corner, but even then it's just like some random person whose name is probably not Bob. Um, and yeah, then I have to engage in chat and then you have to put a username and it's not very good. You've got a bit of glass that's your interface between your company and the person. So the more humanity that we can put into our websites and our designs, then um, this closer to bond is to the, to the customer. Because it's us humans on one end, it's humans on the other, but there's a lot of um, robotics and everything along the way. People don't like it when they get things wrong. Um, when you start filling out a form, you do server-side validation. Oh man, I forgot to do that checkbox. Could I repopulate the fields that have just been submitted? Nah, too much effort. Um, you just lost a customer again. So this is basically punishing the person for more than it's worth. People will make mistakes. Sometimes you'll get your email address in the wrong format. That happens, you know. That's what validation is actually for. It's not there to smack them over the wrist every time they type something. So following on from that is clearly marking invalid fields. So I've made a mistake. Tell me about it nicely and actually show me what I've done wrong. Um, my sister-in-law published a recipe online, she wanted votes for it, I'm really nice, so even when they said, you have to sign up just to vote for this recipe, yeah, um, I pushed through and said, okay, you know, I, I love my sister-in-law so much, I'm actually going to sign up for this thing. Um, because I've been working with forms for so long, the first thing I do when I see one is try to break it and see what goes wrong. So I started filling it out and thought, no, let's see how it goes wrong. Now, this is what the, this is in a regular, I mean, what height is this? It's about a thousand pixels high. You can't even see the fields that have gone wrong. This is a really lazy way of coding, where you wait until a person hits submit. So this is too late, basically. We saw too early before. And when they hit submit, you just go through and loop through the, um, the fields that belong to the form check if each one's valid. I've now got um, an array, I can turn that into a string, I'll just put it up the top of the form, done, easy. Except I've got no idea which fields you're talking about when you're telling me. It's trying to give me password validation stuff as well. So what I'd have to do is read the validation message, scroll down and hope I can actually find the field that you're talking about, have a crack at it, getting it right, scroll back up again, okay, what's the next one I've done wrong? People do not fill these things out. They will give up. How do we do it right? Um, this is a birth date input. You need to put the error message right next to the input, basically. So when I've got it wrong, and you can see here there are some ARIA properties as well, so cited users have actually got an association. The error message is a label, so there's a direct... Um, like semantic relationship between the error message and the field. How you display this is entirely up to you. There are lots of different ways you can do that. So I'm not actually showing the visual of what to do. Uh, but the code that you write should look something very much like this. And you could use JS and just drop the error message somewhere in the DOM and who cares, but then you, you're losing all your accessible users at the same time. So you want to end up with something basically along the lines of this. When we're getting into more complex validations, you have patterns. You need to let them know as soon as it's reasonable to let them know. Um, so if I've got um, like an ID that has to be in a certain format, don't wait until they've gotten to the submit button to actually validate that. Let them know as soon as it's gone wrong. But that's as soon as is on blur, basically. So as soon as they lose focus on the field, let them know. Don't steal the focus back or they'll hate you. Just let them go on and just let it happen within the flow of the form. Now, in terms of form validation, things that people don't like, you really, really need to enforce the minimum rules, not the maximum. And this usually happens in terms of either lazy coding or someone's written a spec that's really detailed. 
So lazy, lazy coding example is where you need a numeric field. Um, I've got a phone number. In the database, we store it as numbers. So what am I going to do? Could I strip out the spaces on it? No, 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 no. I've got better than that. I will make the users take the spaces out of their phone number. When you look at your credit card, when you're entering a credit card in, with Visa and MasterCard and most, Amex got a different pattern. You've got the four blocks of numbers with spaces between them. This is how humans work. We can't remember a string of 16 numbers very easily. We can't transcribe them very easily. Break it up, put some spaces in there, it makes sense. This also helps in terms of making sure the person enters the right information. If I'm looking at my credit card and typing the number in, and I'm looking at what's on the screen, and those numbers in the patterns correlate with each other, then I've got a great, much greater chance of actually getting it right. But if you force me to take the spaces out, or the brackets and area codes, or anything else along the lines of that, then you're basically inviting people to make mistakes. And these are the kinds of mistakes that you're not going to pick up on your validation. With a phone number, I can put in a perfectly valid phone number that's not my number, that I quickly look at, that looks all right, the format's out, so it's close enough. And then someone on the other end tries to actually phone them, you can't contact your customer. So the risk of being overly zealous is that you actually lose people along the way. Now, I've mentioned regular expressions are tricky. Um, copy and paste, put that into your code and strip out the spaces. You have no excuses anymore. If anyone here um, is responsible for a form of entering credit cards or anything and you've not done this in about a week, then shame on you. Here's another example of copy and paste in the spec. You should never, ever show anything like this. Password validation is a bit of a, uh, a wasp nest to start with anyway. Uh, most of the time, uh, passwords have changed quite a lot over the last couple of years. At least they should have. But we're still stuck in the old way of thinking of, OK, I'm going to make it really complex. Uh, I'm going to put a special character in there. Nothing's going to crack that. I'm awesome. Um, but that was that way of thinking amongst the tech people, like the security people, has gone out years ago, and yet we're still enforcing this stuff. This is crazy. So I can use something like one password, which will generate a really hard to crack password, but then I have to put all your stupid validation rules in here, and reduce the security of my my password along the way. Um, this one that they've got here is eight to thirty characters. That's not too bad. I mean, the longer the better. But as soon as you're putting these rules in here, if I wanted to crack this site, I've got a great idea of the patterns that you're using. Most attacks these days happen via database. Um, I mean, you've, your database is going to get violated sooner or later. It's something you have to accept. And once they work that out, then every single database in the system is gone anyway. Um, so if you're still relying on username and password as a really effective form of security, then you've basically got yourself fooled. There are much better ways of doing it these days. You need to think about that if you're into a really secure environment. For most corporate things, it's probably not as important because it's almost security through obscurity. If you're going to be a potential target at some point, this is not good enough anymore. Then, of course, if you're Microsoft, um, you'll just scare the pants off people pretty fast. This is a real error message as well. This is not even a joke. As real as it is, it was a bug that came up with this, but, oh, man. When I was working in tech support years ago, occasionally you'd come across an error that you find where you work out what the solution is eventually after banging your head against the wall for a few days. And then at the end of it, you fix the problem so the user's happy. But you're not, because the hell that you've gone through to reach that point was just not worth it. I would hate to think what happened between someone coming up with this error and someone like getting reported to the uh, developer. It's like, this error has come up. Um, what on earth has gone wrong along the way? I really don't want to know. Strangely, people really don't like it when you're trying to enforce rules on things. This tweet is probably one of the earlier ones along this thread. There's one every couple of weeks these days because people are getting really frustrated on password enforcement. Um, and no one likes it. Like I said, most of us, unless you're really up to date with what's happening in the security world, 
you have no idea of what a valid password is. And when you try to enforce it, especially on um, people who do know what's going on, we don't like you very much. It's not very good. Um, but yeah, you need to be a little bit more nice about that. But yeah. This last point is a really simple one to write, but really hard to execute. You have to get it right. Um, this is basically testing, but it's testing on a technical level as well. If you've got a test team, then you can hand it off to them and whatever testing you've got. But you need to think about the more validation that you put on, the harder it is for it to be right, especially when you're doing multi-field validation and things like that. You need to think about those edge cases when you're writing it. And this one is one that got me. In Perth, I live in a suburb called Mount Lawley. Um, we don't have mountains in Perth, but we like to dream big. Mount is sometimes M-O-U-N-T, sometimes it's M-T. In their database, it's M-O-U-N-T, so when I put M-T, Mount Lawley, then they told me that there's no such suburb and I can't possibly live there. I'm pretty sure when I go home every day that my house is still there, unless something's happened, I don't know. Um, but this is just the worst kind of error message. You're basically telling the user you don't know where you live. But what if a new address gets added, a new, new apartment gets built, and it's not in your database because your database is six months, 12 months out, and you're validating based on that? It's a really bad way to go. The nice way of doing this, it's, it's good to validate. I mean, ultimately what we're trying to do is help the user and help us so that when this parcel gets delivered, it just doesn't turn up to an empty lot um, or someone else's house. That's what we're trying to avoid. So the nice way of doing that is back to the first point of let the people make a mistake. My database says, hey, your, your address doesn't exist. Instead of actually coming up with an error, let them know and say, hey, your address looks a little bit different from what I was expecting. Um, Here's what I think it should be. Apple do this really well at the moment. But if you're sure that you've got it right, then that's OK. I'll trust that you know what you're actually typing in here. And that, that's essentially what you need, you need to get down to. Email addresses are a special hell unto themselves. Because email validation, if you've read the email spec, like there is a spec of what the form of email addresses are like. It is horrendous. There are so many valid forms of email addresses that don't pass validations. And here's Andy Clark. He's got a, a plus in his email address and, you know, a Starbucks. Who has a plus in their email address? Like, well, people can and they do. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, this is kind of getting back to pattern validation and things like that with regular, ex regular expressions. Don't drop it into Google and expect the first result to be right. Just because you don't understand regular expressions, don't assume that anyone else really does either. Most of the ones that are out there are pretty horrible. And once again, we've lost another customer. Yay! How do we actually do this? Um, first thing you need to do is basically embrace HTML and push it a bit further. HTML5 is great. It's the first HTML spec that actually had built-in forms validation, and it's got some really good stuff in there. It's not perfect because the browser vendors aren't perfect, but there's, there's enough there that you might as well start from there and move on. If you use something, like you can use a monolithic uh, validator like um, jQuery validation, um, but the problem is they basically looking at it from the wrong way around. They've said, nothing in the browser is worth hanging on to, so I'm just going to completely rewrite everything from scratch. And you can customize it any way you like, which adds about 200k to the download. Um, starting with the native DOM that you've got is the best way forward. And then polyfills. I mean, IE8, despite pleading, is still there. Um, but you can use polyfills to basically make a lot of these things work. I've got a special note here. This is for Bootstrap. I know Bootstrap is really widely used, and I don't want to see a show of hands because I don't really want to know. Um, Bootstrap is great in theory, but in practice, some of the things that they recommend aren't very good. So I'm putting this here as if you're using Bootstrap, be really, really careful about what they're doing, especially on the form side of things because that's what I pay attention to. Some of their recommendations are actually really bad. Um, so you need to be really careful about what you're doing. 
So how do you roll your own since you've given up on every other? Um, start with HTML5 boilerplate or something similar. The key thing with anything that you see out there, and, and this is another reason why I don't really like uh, Bootstrap very much, is customization is, is kind of hard. You need to be on a pretty high level to get near it. Whereas something like boilerplate, they're inviting you from the outset to customize it. It's really well documented. Line by line, you can see what everything means and you can go in there and change it and do it yourself. If you're copying and pasting code from anywhere, anywhere then you, know, you probably really need to think about what you're doing to start with. But it's really important. This is what's on every single page of your site. You need to pay attention to that. Modernizer is part of boilerplate, but it's really useful, especially for polyfills and things like that, which these days is basically IE8. There is a trend at the moment to not use um, um, libraries such as jQuery. Uh, if you've seen what performance impacts jQuery has on mobile, just to render. Uh, from a couple of years ago, an iPhone 4S, which is a little bit dated, but still in reasonably good use. It took about one second just to parse and execute jQuery once it's on the client. That's crazy. If you pay attention to performance, that's about uh, about 5% of your users gone just because you're using jQuery. So you've got to be really careful about this stuff. There are nice ways of lazy loading and everything, but it's something you need to pay attention to. Anyway, I use jQuery. Since I've bagged it, I actually use it. You could use native JS if you're really good. Um, then you need about six months coding, and then you actually come up with something I prepared earlier. Um, I wrote my, my own validation library. This one is about uh, 13 years old. Um, it's been, it's up to version 4 at the moment. I wrote it when I was working at a, um, at Westrail, which is the state uh, rail company in Western Australia. And at the time, validation was really interesting because if you got something wrong, then it wasn't unusual for a train driver or a train controller to physically pick up their monitor and throw it across the room. So if you made a mistake, you found out pretty hard. And if they phoned you up to speak to you, they weren't very nice about it either. Uh, it's about as brute force a way to write any kind of val or any code at all, to be honest, because if you get it wrong, you're going to find out. Uh, so you, you just cost $10,000 in monitors because you made a mistake. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I feel good. Uh, it's been around for a while. I'm not very good at documenting my open source stuff, um, but you can contact me and get help for it. This is just my way of doing it. Um, I'm not really saying that you should use it necessarily, but as long as you follow the rules of how to make forms nice to people, then you know, you're on, on to a good start. So use this if you want, don't if you don't, doesn't bother me. If you want to read more about it, um, I wrote in NetMag last year, you can get the physical or digital copies of that, or you can even go online and just read it, and that's just how to basically implement Quay.js. I could go into a lot more detail in it, but you can just read about it here, so that's okay. And here we get to, I've got a three-year-old son, so my entire frame of reference at the moment is based around children's things. I, I can't even think outside that. It's really quite sad. So we're on to Dr. Seuss. Um, this is your takeaway message from today, which is basically be more human. Unless you actually care about this, Nothing is going to change. Nothing is going to get better. Every single one of us in the room here at some point, look, probably even today if you've used a form, has gone there and it just hasn't worked right because someone hasn't paid attention to what they're doing. We're the people that can make the difference. Um, you need to do it. If you're the one that's writing the code and the spec is bad, go talk to the person who made the spec and get them to change it because it will make a difference. And we're not just talking, I, I talk a lot about customers and things like that. Uh, the humanity of forms can run a lot deeper than that. In uh, California, they've got the, or in the US, they've got the food stamps program. California in particular, they've got a, uh, I think it's about a 16 page form that you need to fill out to subscribe to this. Now the food bank program is for people who are in the really low socioeconomic um, part of society. So, the odds of their literacy is low. The odds of them having a computer in the first place is low, and they've got 16 pages of detailed questions to fill out. That is inhumane. 
you are actively preventing people from getting food for their kids because your form is bad. Hopefully none of us were involved in that kind of thing. But this is the difference that you can make. If you're selling something and your form is nice and easy to follow, then you will sell more things. You'll make people happy at the end of it. You can find the slides for this one up on SlideShare. Otherwise, I'm on Twitter. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Knowing that uh, almost all of us have coded web forms, I'm sure we can get a couple of questions, maybe? Questions for Chris. Mike is going. Just because you mentioned Twitter Bootstrap, um, could you point out like the three most things you hate on that regarding forms? Or what, you sh what we should really take care of? There are a couple of things. I haven't really looked at it for a couple of years. Um, but some of their placements of error messages and things like that, and just their, their form layouts are a little bit wrong. There's nothing really evil about it. It's just that it's not quite the best practice, basically. So if you're using it, don't feel bad. But just don't use it. <laughs> Great. Maybe one more? I should mention that Thomas asked me to look at Cystic. And, yes, uh, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. And I did, but yeah, there were worse examples out there. As uh -oh. much as they're bad. We're going to bring out all the names now. We have, <laughs> we have one more question, but the Cystic thing, please take a look. I mean, who hadn't had trouble with Cystic? Cystic <laughs> is the ticket booking uh, system in Singapore for concerts and stuff. So it seems quite easy to find resources online on how to do these things wrong. And once in a while, you'll get a really good article, like from Stripe, for example, on how to do credit card entry correct. But I have yet to find a comprehensive updated guide that, that really covers uh, the breadth that you need to build a bunch of different kinds of web apps. It's like one thing to read an article, here's how to do credit cards. But there's dozens of types of data that we always collect. Um, and if you read 12 articles, you end up with a form that doesn't make any sense because you're following best practices from different authors. So what is your recommendation about finding and tracking like the, the current state of the art for usability of forms? I really wish I had an answer for that, and I don't. Uh, the biggest problem is, I mean, here we are at a developer conference. Most of the discussion that's going on about forms and making them right is amongst the UX circles. And nothing ever seems to go outside of that because it's all so UX-centric and it's so far away from actually writing some code that, yeah, they're talking about some nice things and they'll talk about generics, like how to do a great uh, contact form. But when you're sitting there and you've got you know, a 10-page uh, insurance claim form that you've got that's got some really obscure questions, you're not going to find a reference for it. Um, my experience is you kind of have to put it in the hard yards and ask for help when you get stuck. Yeah, unfortunately, the state of forms on the web is bad because no one really pays much attention to it enough. Um, I mean, I'm a form specialist only by virtue of having done it lots. It's not that I even really care about them that much. I wish they just worked and I wasn't here. But, um, yeah, if there was a reference out there for how to do this stuff, then it would be a whole lot better. You mentioned credit card forms. They've gotten a bit better over the last couple of years. Uh, but there was for a while, like, how do you do a credit card form? How do you actually get that right? And Amazon was the one that everyone went to. It's like, Amazon, they must have actually looked at this and worked it out. So the first thing you do is jump onto Amazon. Okay, so they've mapped out the credit card form like that. I'll copy that. That's great. Um, I think this was PayPal when they set up. They first copied into Amazon and everything was fine. Now, um, the guy that did that, that copied the Amazon form into PayPal, years later he was working at Amazon and found the people that actually developed that initial form and said, you know, I've been modelling everything I've done based on your credit card form. Can you tell me how you put it together? Oh, we copied it from someone else. <laughs> Most people don't actually stop and think about what's going on. And the best thing that's happening with credit cards these days is using a camera on your phone to scan the thing. Um, Apple are doing that with Apple Pay. So you don't have to actually type anything at all. And the best forms, I think, the progression of forms is trying to make people not write anything in at all. Um, yeah, the best form is one that you don't have to fill out. Cool. I think there's also a bit of opportunity to fill in these do's and don'ts. I mean, there are almost 300 people here. <laughs> Feel free to do it. I think there would be a lot of people thanking you for it. Thank you, Chris.
Thank you. Thank you, Chris.